Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. And uh, for those of you who are celebrating Eid al-Adha today, I wish you a happy and blessed Eid with your loved ones. My name is Marwa Tafta, and I am the Middle East and North Africa Policy Manager at Access Now. And it is my absolute pleasure to be uh, moderating the closing ceremony to what has been an incredibly inspiring, exciting, and also exhausting week at RoxCon. Um, I want to start on a personal note to say how incredible I find it that each one of us is sitting right now in front of a small screen uh, in many different corners of the world um, with different backgrounds, literally speaking. Yet here we are emerging after a week of run with a strong sense of community, with great deal of enthusiasm, energy, uh, creativity and resilience. And this really gives me a great do deal of hope um, going, going forward that somehow we are ready for the challenges ahead from the imminent threat of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic to many of the structural and systematic problems it has unearthed and intensified in our societies. Uh, racial, social, economic injustices and discrimination, colonization and its continued legacies, patriarchy, um, surveillance, capitalism, you name it. Um, and sometimes I feel like whenever we look around, there are so many fires and smoke, uh, it becomes sometimes difficult to look up for a clear patch of blue sky. Um, and as cheesy as this sounds, to me, RightsCon did exactly that. Um, it brought us together as a community. It uh, gave us a space to think collectively, to be in solidarity, and to the boundaries of many of the issues we're uh, grappling with. And I want to uh, stop here and pause uh, to reflect as we're convening uh, now on, on many of the people and communities who are currently on the front lines, fighting for human rights, protesting on the streets, fighting back in courts, and many of them are behind bars for speaking up and for defending our rights in Egypt, in India, in Myanmar, in many, many other places. And just to like give a, an overview and highlight what has been happening this week, as all of us, all of us has, have got together to discuss digital rights issues and internet freedoms. Um, in Hong Kong, for example, this week, uh, four student uh, activists have been arrested and charged under the newly adopted uh, national security law. Uh, even in countries where democratic safeguards exist on paper, uh, many governments continue to undermine freedom of press um, and attack uh, uh, independent uh, media and independent nonprofits. In Hungary, for example, the editor-in-chief of the biggest independent online news site, Index, was fired following imminent political and financial pressure. Then the full editorial board of 80 to 100 people also resigned, and now they are facing uh, retaliation. We're also very disturbed by the recent news that uh, from the US uh, that the Open Technology Fund, uh, fund is bringing 80% uh, of the internet freedom projects and services to a complete halt due to arbitrary and unnecessary delay in funding, jeopardizing lives of millions of users who rely on their technologies worldwide. And the list of human rights violations is really long and uh, it's pretty grim. But uh, bring it to a lighter uh, note, uh, I want to mention one of my favorite book titles by African-American author and poet Alice Walker. Um, it's called Hard Times Require Furious Dancing. And maybe if we were in Costa Rica, that's what we would probably do after the closing ceremony. But given where we are, I would say hard times uh, require radical imagination. So following one week of many interesting discussions on the issues we're grappling with, thinking forward, how can we build just equitable systems for the future? How can we um, have technologies that connect us without preying on our privacy and personal data? What kind of internet 
in the future we would like to have. And to help us think through these questions and share with us um, their visions for the future, uh, reimagining our present, I would like to welcome our distinguished guests and speakers for today. Uh, Nicholas Thompson, Editor-in-Chief of The Wired magazine, Commissioner Antonia Orejola Neguera, Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and Zaid Radir Hussain, former UN Commissioner for Human Rights, a member of the Elders and Professor uh, at Penn Law Faculty. So I will be totally gender biased and uh, give the floor uh, to our uh, women speaker, Commissioner Antonia. Uh, the rights of indigenous people is one of the main thematic pillars at RightsCon and in trying to envision what a, a, an inclusive, decolonized uh, internet to the indigenous communities and many cities around the world, are there any inter-American standards on the rights of indigenous people that must be taken into account regarding the digital divide and access to the internet? The floor is yours. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to the organizers and also it's an honor to be here with the co-panelists. Um, I also want to say hi to everybody that's listening from wherever you are. Um, I think this is a really good event. I'm so sorry we couldn't do it in Costa Rica. It would have been much more representative also. Of, we could have been even with the indigenous people in the meeting, but well, we're in the middle of the pandemic, so um, we have to make the most of it. So nobody imagined before the pandemic that the world we're living today and the arrival of the virus with no doubt at all has challenged the impact that technology has on today, today's society and human rights. Um, as from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, during the context of the COVID, I, I myself have, have seen the importance of technology, I have been able to have a dialogue with different organizations and leaders of indigenous people throughout the Americas, something that before we wouldn't do. So I think um, it has shown us the importance of technology. We have been able to observe how a large group of indigenous leaders have, got, have appropriated the technology. They have been using cell phones, community radios, televisions, production of videos, instant messages. And that's beginning to be part of their daily life. And um, they're using technology as a form of cultural and political resistance, developing and communica communicating strategies on their right to autonomy and self-determination. I myself have been, have been in meetings with indigenous people from the Amazons, and you see them with their cell phones, moving around even up on trees, and I'm not joking when I talk about that, to have access to internet and to be able to meet with the commission. So, of course, um, this the pandemic is something that has been awful for the, for, for the world today, but also it has um, required us to seek opportunities about um, indigenous, I mean, technology. And before talking about the inter-American human standards, I, I, I think we have to make ourselves some questions, especially regarding the, the people that are here with me today and, and also <laughs> the people that are listening to us today. There's a lot of questions uh, on how, how we can seize opportunities, which also support indigenous people in addressing the gaps and challenges. We must ask ourselves, how does technology treat indigenous people? How much of that treatment is with their participation and consent. Do indigenous people have the same possibilities of making use of technology as other actors in society? Does a different med does the use, sorry, of different media contribute to the transmission of their historical memory or their physical and cultural survival? Or on the contrary, as some indigenous leaders pointed out on some of the events that took us took out this week, does the access to different media put at risk their heritage and may even mean an extinction of their culture? What can organizations that work with new technologies and human rights like Access Now do to guarantee the access of indigenous people to internet, to information? What can the organizations do for capacity building, especially regarding to the elders of the indigenous communities? The elders are essential in transmitting their culture and heritage to the younger ones but they do not understand the use of these new technologies. There are urgent matters that we must focus on. 
There are so many issues to be addressed, and undoubtedly many have been discussed through these days. And it seems to me that RiceCon has been very visionary when it raised these matters before the pandemic. And of course, today, with COVID-19, um, it has been palpable to, to us, the, the, the digital divide, more palpable than ever. And in that sense, um, before addressing um, the question you asked me, when, when we're talking about indigenous people and access to technology, when we're talking about the digital divide and the gap, we're talking about, um, for example, last week in Deutsche Welle, uh, showed the case of a Quechua family in the Andi Andean region whose children had to walk every day to the highest mountain to connect with one cell phone for the three children to have classes online. That is what we're talking about when we talk about indigenous people and technology and the gap that we see today. On, the, on another case, is the senior teacher who works with Mapuche children who do not have technology. They don't have access to internet. They don't have computers. They don't have cell phones. And so what does her teacher do? She goes every week, once a week on her horse to visit all of her students and give them homework. And then the week after that, she goes and gets the homework and gives them new homework. So of course, the digital um, gap is of importance when we talk about inclusion, when we talk about democracy, when we talk about a democratic society in a post-pandemic world. And we must take charge of these issues urgently. And in that sense, um, the, the Inter-American Human, Human Rights Commission and the Inter-American Court, we do have some standards on these issues. Um, and those standards are, first of all, in the Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous People. It says, the Article 14 says, and I'm, I'm sorry if I read it, but I think it's important to see that we already have standards on these issues. It says that Indigenous people have the right to promote and develop all their communication systems and media, including their own radio and television programs, and to have equal access to all other forms of communication and information. States shall take measures to promote the broadcasting of radio and television programs in indigenous languages, particularly in regions where there is an indigenous presence. presence. States shall support and facilitate the establishment of indigenous radio and television stations, as well as other means of information and communication. This, of course, what I have just read, is, cr is crucial in the pandemic context. Because despite the, despite the widespread situation of limited access to the media, we have seen the importance of information campaigns that Indigenous people have developed to inform their members about COVID-19 and prevention measures in their own languages, thus ensuring the cultural relevance of these means of information transmission. And the Inter-American Commission has, has a res resolution, Resolution 120, um, that is precisely about the pandemic and human rights, and it has recommendations for the states of the OAS regarding different issues relating to the pandemic, of course, and human rights. But one of the issues is exactly that states must guarantee um, that the people, especially vulnerable groups, have access to internet and all other kinds of media. We're talking about a continent where 23% of the population today does not have any access to internet. The Inter-American Development Bank, Bank has said that in Latin America, indigenous people have less than half the access to mobile phones than the non-indigenous peers. In Bolivia, internet access is four times less for indigenous people than for non-indigenous people. Access to a computer is far less for indigenous people in Bolivia, Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. And that implies an evident digital exclusion. If we don't address these issues, of course, it has an impact on human rights. It has an impact on democracy. And that is one of the issues that the commission has been working on with the repertoire on freedom of expression. And um, that's why we think that this issue is so important, um, what you have been discussing this week, especially not only for indigenous groups, but all vulnerable groups, and especially in the context we have today of the pandemic, because the pandemic, of course, has apparently is here to stay for a long time. So access to internet has, of course, a whole dimension on democracy and human rights and how we can access to and guarantee human rights to everybody. And I, just to finish, regarding the, these kind of situations. 
Um, I just want to mention we have a case today that has just been sent to the Inter-American Court regarding regarding these issues we're discussing today about um, the indigenous people of Sumpango in Guatemala and uh, community radios, all the legislation in Guatemala, I'm not going to go through the details of the, of the case, but all the legislation in Guatemala um, is against is against the inclusion of of human rights uh, of um, indigenous people and we have a case which is going to be very important on these issues the case is from april we sent it to the court in april just when the pandemic was starting but i think it's going to be very important because we will um be able to to discuss in inter-american standards on a on a case for the very first time uh, in the presence of the inter-american court i think um those are my first remarks i have been a bit um um, messy to 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 talk about so many issues. There's not much time, but once again, I want to thank you for this invitation. And I think this is a very important issue. If it was before the pandemic, today is absolutely crucial that states, international organisations, and technology companies also address the gap, address this digital gap, thank because you. it has, of course, it has. It's very important for the for the people and democracy in the Americas and, and the whole world. Thanks a lot, Commissioner, for capturing the main struggles of the indigenous communities and peoples around the world, uh, especially when it comes to access to the internet and new technologies. I will move the conversation to Nick. Um, and I mean, Nick, you are um, the the editor of one of the prominent magazines on uh, technologies and the impact. Uh, of, of these technologies on our on politics and uh, societies, and from where you sit, also thinking into the future, what do you think is coming ahead of us? And I mean, being right now at RightsCon, obviously it's a conference on the intersection of human rights and technology. So how can we mainstream human rights into new technologies that are emerging from the Silicon Valley, but also in many other parts of of the world? Oh, that's a fabulous question. I mean, the way I think about it is that the struggle for democracy and human rights with respect to technology is the story of our times. When these technologies were invented and they first started to become a big part of our lives 20 years ago, it seemed to me inevitable that the internet by connecting people, by making information accessible to all, would just accelerate democracy and would increase human rights and would accelerate equality. And what we've seen is that over time, there's actually the opposite has largely happened. It's helped authoritarian states. In many cases, it's pushed democracy to the background. It's actually accelerated inequality. But I think what's happened in the last couple of years, and it's reflected in the success of RightsCon, the extraordinary things that have been discussed at RightsCon, the initiatives that have been launched at RightsCon, is become clearer and clearer that everybody is realizing that. It's also clear to a certain degree in the antitrust hearings we had in the United States just two days ago. So I think the conversation about technology is changing. The initial assumption was that technology would ineluctably bring about more democracy, civil rights, human rights. Now, pretty much everybody is realizing it's not the case. So the next couple of years are going to be about that struggle, how to build basic rights into coming artificial intelligence, how to use technology to empower media and fair reporting as opposed to to disempower it how to use technology to facilitate democracy as opposed to just to facilitate authoritarianism so that is a way of saying i can't tell you exactly what's coming in answer to your question but i feel better about where we are at least in the conversation than i did a couple of years ago The age of innocence, thinking that the internet will liberate the world to age of experience, where exactly uh, the conversation or the focus on human rights should be right at the center uh, of new technologies. I want to dig a little bit further in something you mentioned. Uh, given that many independent media agencies and organizations are currently under attack, what needs to be done uh, for these organizations to survive? Uh, what is required from our community and also from governments, uh, international organizations, uh, maybe other media organizations as well to keep uh, freedom of press afloat in these times. 
Yeah, well, you know, there was a proposal earlier this week at Access Now for public funding of independent media organizations. It would make them less independent if they're publicly funded, but public funding for fair media organizations across the globe, which I thought is a very worthy initiative. One of the big changes that needs to happen is for the algorithms, which distribute readers and in some ways distribute economics to make sure that they are prioritizing truth, prioritizing people who are doing their best to get things right, to not use the algorithms to just prioritize outrage and emotion. I think that is the fundamental error of the social media platforms over which so much democratic discourse happens. So the extent that the algorithms and the artificial intelligence that powers all of these can push us towards truth, accuracy, fairness, that ultimately does help the media organizations. And then it's also incumbent upon the media organizations. And this is one of the struggles at Wired to build viable business models. Certainly in the United States, we had a long period where you know, there was a monopoly on a form of advertising. That monopoly disappeared. It's the way capitalism works. Capitalism is often paired with democracy. And so it is incumbent upon media organizations like Wired to identify new business models and for the public to recognize the civic value of what organizations like this do and to support it. So it's a combination of government action, philanthropic action, people, the journalists themselves, and the underlying structure of the internet all have to act in unison to recognize that civil society, democracy works best if the press can be free and the press can be fair. Thanks a lot, Nick. I uh, will move now to our third speaker, uh, Zaid. Um, I'm so happy you're with us and I will totally take advantage of the fact that we both come from the same region. Um, as a Palestinian, I want to hear your views um, about, uh, and your vision as well, about the region, uh, many regions around the world, but especially ours, where there seems to be like an interesting contradiction on the one hand, we're still dealing with age-old problems like unemployment, poverty, war, bloodshed, and yet at the same time, many governments in, in, in the region trying to rush to adopt new technologies such as digital IDs um, and other biometric uh, data processing technologies like contact tracing apps and so on, um, with very little regard to human rights. What do you think is the way forward to, for us to get out of this uh, this crisis of priorities, I, sh I should say? Uh, well, thank you, Marwa, for uh, inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today, the day of the, the Eid. I should be having a day off, but I'm happy to be here with all of you. And thank you, Brett and Nikki. Uh, it's been an amazing week. I've enjoyed all the fireside chats and I've enjoyed the panels and uh, even for many of us who've worked in the space when we feel we've begun to know, there's always, there's always uh, the odd surprise, the piece of detail that you didn't know beforehand. And it makes this an, an immensely rich conference. And so thank you for having me. I'm going to begin by not answering your question. Um, in, in, the, in the sort of first part of my response, I think listening to Nick, you know, I, I can't but help feel that the digital age in one way has dehumanized us. Um, it has created out of our lives bits. We've become shadow individuals uh, parlayed from one uh, uh, firm to another. Um, our lives are in bits. Our thoughts are in bits. Our economies are in bits. Our political life is in bits. And when we speak about the regulation of this space, I would argue that less speaking or less paying attention to the legal regulation, uh, we need to f invest more into thinking about the contextual regulation of this space. The, the world in, is falling apart, as we've heard time and again over the last few days, and I'll come to the Middle East in, or the MENA region in a few minutes. And, and that is what will determine eventually where the tech industry needs to go. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example. The, the situation between China and the US is very concerning to, to everyone. 
And through a series of miscalculations, we could easily see a giant confrontation between two nuclear powers. It's not difficult to foresee this. So let's assume that the, and you can see China being led uh, toward a very nationalistic position, and so is the US. I mean, President Trump makes no sort of bones about it. And let's say for the sake of argument, we do have something short of a conflict or a conflict in being. And if I was a Chinese American living in the US, I'd be very concerned, right? I mean, we've seen this before. There, weren't, there won't be internment camps, but it's quite possible that the US government would approach the big tech companies and tell them, give me everything about all my Chinese citizens. I need to know what they're up to. And it's at that point where the tech companies are going to be tested. And, and there we will see what position they're going to take. I'm not convinced that many will not turn over the data. I think one or two leaderships I'm impressed by, I'm not impressed by the rest. And, and that would be the telling point. Um, and I, I hope we can sort of uh, talk about that. The Middle East, yes. It, I, I mean, I, a few years ago, I, I was spent a week in Silicon Valley. I was uh, amazed by what I saw in, in technology terms. And then 10 days later, I was in, uh, in Tripoli in Libya. And I mean, a, a, a situation where there was absolutely no law and order, complete insecurity violence of the most terrible kind and the, and the people living under great anxieties, not knowing whether they're going to live an, another day. And it occurred to me that really the, the space between Silicon Valley and Libya was not so great, was not so great. Uh, if you imagine a cyber war where the electric grid is, is you know, killed off in this country, by and large, I live in the United States, now, how soon would it be before we become like a Libya? Already with COVID, we can see the stresses and strains of society here, you know? And so it is, we are trapped in this, in this uh, sort of space where we seem to be unable to graduate and lift ourselves out of the misery that so many people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. I have, I have also a positive message, but I'm going to leave it to the end. <laughs> I mean, I have one, uh, one additional question for you, being the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, and this year is the UN's uh, 75th anniversary, and uh, what I wanted to ask you, like, what must change to ensure the relevance of the UN bodies in the digital age? Like, how can we uh, and our communities maintain watch the human rights pillar, which is unfortunately the least funded of the three pillars uh, of, of the UN. Well, you know, it, to all of us in the human rights community, we understand the importance of it. It's surprising, actually, how many outside of our community don't understand it, especially in the global north. I mean, it hardly ever figures into business literature, you hardly ever see it in academic literature outside of legal literature or the work done specifically on human rights. It's quite amazing to see. Um, look, the, the UN is a reflection of the world. The, the UN, I've long said, is as pathetic or as great as the world is outside. It's a reflection of it, as are all the, these big groups, the group you know, G20, G8, G7, so forth. Uh, they're not going to be vastly better because essentially the reform has to begin within states and then it's it's sort of the the shine will 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 sort of grace itself on uh, the international organizations at the moment uh, i think covid has proven what a failure we are as humanity i mean <laughs> this pandemic this coronavirus i mean it's hardly new to us i mean ever since human beings began to roam the earth we've had disease and pestilence and then you had the Black Death. and I mean, it's hardly new to us, and yet utterly incapable of creating systems whereby a serious health outbreak in one country doesn't affect everyone else. I mean, it's a terrible indictment of us. And I think part of the problem we have is that our, our belief in the wonderment of technology has also ex made us accept the arrogance uh, of those who peddle it as, as if it's going to solve all our problems. The problems actually are human problems, and they must begin with much better quality global leadership 
because unless we have that, uh, I think we are in peril. And um, it, I'm always reminded of the comments that Niels Bohr penned to uh, FDR, to F Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1944, when he said, yes, the atomic bomb could give you some temporary military advantage and a very brutal war, but it will be a perpetual menace to human society. And I fear this is now where technology is. It's going to be a perpetual menace. But there is a positive note. I mean, when I look at the amazing work of Max Schrempf, and we had the decision handed down by the European Court of Justice the other day, I mean, just amazing in, in, in respect of uh, the, the ill-named privacy shield uh, policy. I mean, it's amazing what one activist can do. And when with so many who are working with Access Now um, and also, you know, attending uh, RightsCon, I think, you know, there is plenty of hope too. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm being on a, on a positive note. Um, I think I'm conscious of time. We've reached very quickly to the end of uh, our uh, session. Uh, I want to thank you so much for uh, being with us uh, today and for sharing your visions and insights. Uh, that was very valuable. I will now move uh, the floor or give the floor to my colleague, Nikki. Uh, Nikki, the director of RightsCon. And I want to quickly say before I hand you the mic, Nikki, how impressed I am and I guess everybody else watching us and attending RightsCon. Uh, at how incredible it was and well organized. Uh, it's nothing short of magic. I told you that offline, but I want to say it off online again. Um, thank you so much again. And uh, the floor is yours, Nikki. Great. Thanks so much, Marwa. And thanks so much to the speakers who described sort of the state of where we're at after finishing up five days of RightsCon. And I'm, I'm glad that Marwa used such beautiful words to describe some of the you know, radical imagination that's been demonstrated at RightsCon and that the speakers really commented on the state of where we're at and what needs to happen. Um, you know, Every year, I think we're all blown away as always by this community's commitment and dedication and energy and resilience. And that's more visible here at RightsCon online than ever before. Um, and what we've achieved here was an undertaking that wouldn't have been possible without the help of many, many people, um, without the hard work of the RightsCon team, Sarah, Daphne, Mariana, Rodrigo, Kayla, I hope that you will all join me in thanking them for their tireless work to bring this online. Um, and so many more from the Access Now team, you know, Brett, who had absolute <laughs> unwavering confidence that we could bring this online and make it a space for everyone to connect and to coordinate. Um, Joe, Carolyn, Melissa, Sage, Juliana, Tom, Ben, Nina, Peter, I could go on forever in terms of, you know, the people who really put work behind this. Um, and, a, and a big special thank you to the Tech Change team who played an instrumental role in helping us rethink what this looks like in an online context. So um, big thank you to Ariana, Shannon, Nick, each and every technical moderator that helped us in our sessions and helped us understand how to translate all of this online. Um, and you know, lastly, but surely not least, uh, I wanna thank all of our sponsors who enabled this conversation to happen, who joined us in a largely untested, unknown online platform. Um, and we look forward to continuing to working with all of you into 2021. And so I think a big question that remains um, that I'm sure many of you are asking is what's next? And well, first the RightsCon team and the Access Now team is gonna take some time to rest before we reemerge for the next cycle. Um, but in the short term, a lot of you have been asking about the platform, about what happens to it. And we have some really great news in that the conversation won't finish after we close up uh, closing ceremonies. You'll be able to continue to watch and revisit the content hosted on the platform for the next little while. You know, that was created by all of you for all of you. And we will continue to make it accessible and think about the ways in which we can, um, you know, showcase those important conversations and continue to build off of them. Next, we are looking forward to talking to you all about what we've achieved here. So there's you know, moments to celebrate our successes, document the outcomes and learn about what worked and didn't work um, so that we can adapt to make next year's summit even better. And you know, whether we'll be able to meet in person is something that remains to be determined as the current context evolves. But I think you know, we can all feel confident in the ways this online experience has demonstrated 
the potential and opportunity that we have in creating the spaces to discuss and protect and extend our human rights. And so I think that there's one you know, thing right now that is important for all of you to know, which is that the RightsCon community will come together again in 2021. So on behalf, on behalf of all of us, thank you for coming on this journey with us. Thank you for joining us for our ninth annual summit and the first ever online iteration of RightsCon.